Rev it up and welcome to Cars Yeah, show number 2,482. Today we visit a museum in California, an automotive museum that I've been to. In fact, you can find a Cars Yeah TV show on the Cars Yeah YouTube page about that visit. So be prepared to be inspired. This is Cars Yeah, where you'll enjoy interviews with inspiring automotive enthusiasts. Mark Green is here to provide you with a fuel injection of automotive inspiration. So get in, sit down, buckle up, and get ready for a wild ride here on Cars Yeah. Hello, inspiring automotive enthusiasts, and welcome to Cars Yeah. Well, today I feel I'm a a little bit back home, I'm in Sacramento, California, in a very special place that I've been before with a very special person who wasn't there when I was there about three, four years ago, Karen McLaughlin. Karen, welcome to Cars Yeah. Do you have it in gear? And are you ready to release the clutch? You bet. Let's go. All right. So we are at the uh, California Automobile Museum today. And before I get into your life and your role there because you are a returning person at this museum, which is quite interesting. I always like to break the ice with this question. What's one little thing that people don't know about Karen? I'm pretty open, so there aren't too many things that people don't know about me, but I would have to say I spent my early years um, seeking out artistic avenues. You know, there's there's this little artistic side that didn't always get to appear in jobs. So on the side, I'll do, you know, singing or dancing, or I did um, painting for a while. So yeah, always dabbling in some creative art. Well, in a way, you're still doing that being in an automobile museum, because I always think of automobiles as artistic in a way. They're design oriented. Uh, they appeal to people in a variety of ways. Um, so that kind of makes sense with me. But uh, you uh, you pack and we'll learn this as we talk today. You pack a lot of different facets into this diamond that is your life, if I can put <laughs> it that way. But I love the, the idea that there's a, a very creative side and that you found a way to keep that in your world. That's pretty cool. Thanks. And it's a lot of the reason that I love this job. I've been in nonprofits my whole career, a lot of social services, um, you know, medical health, but the arts end of the nonprofit spectrum is really where my niche is. Very cool. All right. Well, let's learn a lot more about you today. Karen McLaughlin, say that name three times fast, I dare you, is the executive director of the California Automobile Museum in Sacramento, California. It's a, she's a California native uh, that was an executive uh, director of the ALS Association of the California Automobile Museum, where she was there for 2006 to 2015 before she left for a while. We'll learn about that and focused on development at Broadway, Sacramento before returning for a second term where that finds her back there today. She is the finance chair and home group leader and a previous worship leader and conference speaker at a church in a constant pursuit of, as she said, artistic outlets. Karen dabbles in singing. Uh, maybe we'll have her sing today for us. Drama, yeah. dance, <laughs> no, maybe not. <laughs> yeah, You don't want me to sing, that's for sure. And a career creative writing to name just a few. Karen is a breast cancer survivor. That's wonderful. So is my mother. She's a Raiders fan. Ugh, Raiders. Okay. I know. A mother, a grand, a grandmother. <laughs> she has a very full life. Along with her passion for cars, she's a collector of shoes. I promise not to call you Imelda, which she Thank now you. has over a hundred pairs. Okay. We might have to get into that as well. Maybe you're working on starting your own shoe museum. And I'll remind you uh, <laughs> listeners that uh, I, I did a TV show there at the museum uh, with a former staff member, Carly Starr. You can go back and find that show on the Cars yeah TV show on YouTube. We had a lot of fun visiting that museum. So very nice to be back today. We'll be back in just a moment, but first a word from our sponsor. So give them a little love and we'll be right back. Are you ready to take charge of your financial future? then let me introduce you to Capitalize Your Finances. It's an online course designed to empower you with the knowledge and tools for mastering your money. This course will help you lay out the ins and outs of budgeting, the importance of emergency funds, investing strategies, and how to plan for a secure retirement. All this presented by financial planner Chris Paniotu. Chris has developed this course to help you effectively navigate your world of finance, 
with confidence. Stop stressing about money and start taking control. Enroll in Capitalize Your Finance online course today and pave your way to financial success. To learn more, go to CapitalizePodcast.com slash courses or better yet, go to the Cars yeah website show notes page for today's show and click on the link under Capitalize Your Finances. You'll be glad you did. Do it today. For several years now, you've heard me talk about Linkage Magazine. I've been a subscriber since the start. Their talented and creative team brings you a spectacular publication and website that shares the automotive passion from a worldwide perspective. Linkage is about driving, restoring, collecting, and firsthand experience at collector car auctions and more. They bring you real-world values plus rational, experienced opinions on the current markets. They cover the automotive world and the people who share our passions. And Linkage Magazine has grown, mailing you six issues annually. Join me on this journey with Linkage. They're geared for the automotive life. You can subscribe at LinkageMag.com. So, Karen, we are back. So I want to talk a little bit about... The fact that you were there before, you left for a while. Of course, we had COVID going on that really changed the world and especially for museums. But now you find yourself back. So could we start by going back in history a little bit and talk about your, maybe as far back as education and the life you've had moving up to the time you got into the California Automobile Museum? Sure. Well, I went to college with an English major intending to be an elementary school teacher, but obviously that plan changed. And I think that that's true of a lot of people. You know, you think one thing as a young person, but I started volunteering with nonprofits uh, at an early age when my kids were young and I fell in love with it. I've always loved volunteering and it really is the heart blood of nonprofits. So uh, it was an easy transition to go into nonprofits nonprofit management as a career. So that's that was my start. I did uh, join the California Auto Museum in 2006. I was here for about nine years until 2015. And at the time, thought that I was tired of leading. I just need a break. I want a job maybe that I can just kind of clock in and clock out uh, more Somebody else makes the big decisions. So I did that for a while and it was great. I think I needed that break. But when they had the opening here, I joined the board of directors for the California Auto Museum just after pandemic and felt like, okay, it's a good time to get back in. Maybe I can help out. And when the opening happened with the executive director position and they asked, you know, are you interested? It also felt like an easy transition. And since being back, I learned a lot about myself that I actually do like being in charge. <laughs> Maybe what I needed was just a vacation, Yes, um, not a career change. Yeah. So I am loving it. I love the people here. I love the cars. It's all just full circle and it's nice to be back home. My listeners uh, for 10 years now have heard me say this over and over again. You're a great example, Karen, is that we are happiest as people when we find a way to help others. And a lot of people learn that early in life. Perhaps their parents are helpers of others, givers. They donate their time to help others. But a lot of people don't discover it till much later. And I've had guests on the show that didn't discover it until they had a catastrophe in their life. And a great one was uh, Tim Medvets, who was on the show. And it's a great story. Listeners who have it, that missed that show should go back. But the words that were told to him when he was at the lowest point in life, ready to end his life, were a soldier had come back who had lost his limbs and said to him, Tim, your life needs to change. You need to not make it about the Tim show. You need to make it about helping others achieve their goals. And it changed his entire life. So what would you say, it seems like you've had this in your DNA for a long time. Where did you learn that? I think growing up, my parents were volunteers. I worked in the church nursery from the age of nine. Oh, wow. um, you know, we did walks and runs to benefit various various charities. We just did a lot of volunteering, soup kitchens, you name it. So it uh, became what is now, I feel like, an addiction. I just can't live without that volunteer outlet, that mentality of helping others. It really does bring such joy. So for somebody that, and we'll talk about cars in a minute, I promise you that, but I think this is an important topic for somebody, and I hear this from people saying, I'm just too busy, I can't do that. How would you instill into them the thought process of being able to start 
giving back in some way? Because for some people, they go, well, I don't have time to go spend an entire weekend uh, either uh, feeding people or doing something somewhere. How would you advise them to just dip their toe in so they can start to experience the joy that this giving provides those of us who do that? What would be your advice? I would say, first of all, look at what you love. So, for example, the volunteers here, they love cars. So they're able to marry that love with helping people. And volunteers live longer. It's scientifically proven. So get out there. Say your availability. You know, I have two hours a month. If that's what you have, what do you have for me? And maybe you'll get in a position that you absolutely love and it becomes more. Maybe you you find you don't love it. So try something else. But to me, volunteering is the ideal activity to figure out where do my gifts match up with helping people. You hit the nail on the head there, Karen. I kind of hoped you would say that. That is find your passion and go help in that arena first. We have a great museum just 15 minutes from my house, the LeMay Museum. And yes. my neighbor across the street, Bruce, who's uh, been retired for a long time, was looking for something to do. And he donates his time there and he goes and he's getting older, so he has to limit his time, but he just loves to go. He gives people rides in cars. He talks about cars. So he gets to play with cars, which have been his passion in life, and then contribute back. And that leads me to museums because museums need people to help them. Right. Uh, museums are uh, a financial struggle many times to keep the doors open, to run, and the fact that they are a great way for us car folks to donate some time and help. So I appreciate you doing that. So let's talk a little bit about the California Automobile Museum. Automobile Museum. I had a great uh, time being there for a day shooting with Carly when I was there. Tell our listeners a bit about the museum, what it's like today, and some of the many programs that you have involved, get involved with. Sure. Sure. Well, we opened in 1987, so we've been here a while. We've been through a few transitions. We originally opened as the Tau Ford Museum with the collection of Edward Tau. It was the largest collection of Fords in the world at the time. He was looking for a place to display his collection. Sacramento was looking to open a car museum. So uh, we found each other. This was before my time, but I'll say the collective we uh, found each other and opened the museum with uh, all Ford. Um, Unfortunately, Mr. Tao forgot to pay his taxes and Uh-oh. he got in a little trouble with the IRS. Those uh, cars in his collection were auctioned off, but we had a blessed number of uh, members, uh, museum supporters who came to that auction and purchased some of the most valuable. So we still have some of those early Fords in the collection. In fact, we have two Model Ks, which is almost unheard of, um, you know, to have two of those very different models, but, um, you know, telling the story of, of Henry Ford in the early days. So since then, we have added to our collection. We currently own about half the cars that are in the museum and the other half are loaned by private owners. So, you know, we might be looking for a Studebaker. We're going to, you know, seek out uh, Studebaker clubs, Studebaker owners and see if anyone is interested in displaying their car uh, or truck at the museum. Um, And it's on a yearly basis so that we can continue to have a lot of rotation. And that has served us very well over the years. You have a really cool parking lot because there's a big mural on the wall there. And Mm -hmm. when I came to visit and I drove in, I went, this is pretty neat. Has that mural been there the entire time? And who was the artist? There's a local artist. I'll remember his name as soon as we stop talking about it and the pressure's <laughs> off. But uh, he uh, painted those, I'm going to say maybe five, six years ago. So they haven't always been there. They, those were just old garage doors. But they really became kind of our um, you know, symbol, our, our insignia for what we stood for. So it starts out with an early brass car and it goes, you know, I think, to a muscle car. And it's a little bit of everything, what we display. And that's that's truly descriptive of our collection. We have everything from the early years all the way to cars of the future with all alternate propulsion. So you're really going to come and experience a car that you can relate to. 
where we all have this relationship with cars. And I think that's what sets a car museum apart from maybe another museum that, you know, I, I don't have this super personal relationship necessarily with planes or trains or fine art or, you know, whatever it might be. But we do all have a relationship with a car, love or hate it. We do. We have the car that we grew up with. We have the car that we got married in, cars that we brought our babies home in, cars that we drive now. It tells the story of our life. Absolutely. And speaking of a story of your life, I like to ask about uh, mentors or what I call driving inspirations, people that in the car world have been an inspiration to you. So I would have to go to our current board president, Joe Hensler. He was also the board president my first term. So wow. we both kind of returned. I feel like we make a great team. Uh, we love, we both love to get things done. And although we often, you know, might disagree on some things or the pathways to get there, we listen to each other. And he has definitely been a mentor of mine. He is a beyond smart businessman um, who's owned businesses from John Deere tractors to an Italian restaurant restaurant. So a lot of knowledge and a mad car guy. You know, there are so many car museums across the country and I've had guests on the show that have shared all these museums that many of them I've never heard of before. And I always advise people who are listeners of Cars Yeah who love cars, if you're going to visit a city for any reason, seek out a car museum in that city because you may find even a small little one that you went, oh, I never knew this existed. Absolutely. And the same in Europe. I've taken, I used to travel a lot to Europe. I'd do, I'd stay a few extra days, do road trips, and I'd come up on these little museums in the middle of the Black Forest in Germany that you didn't even know was there that was some special focus versus, of course, the grand museums that we have across the country in a museum like you have, which are, are wonderful. If somebody you're listening wanted to go into the world of museums, work in the world, maybe it's a young person that would like to find a summer job or something like that, mm -hmm. what would be your advice for them to seek a career like the one that you've had? Uh, again, I go back to volunteering. Not everyone can afford to do that. But you know what? We all have, you know, maybe it's evenings and weekends or pieces of time available. And it's a great way to figure out what you want to do. I had, you know, a job early on that I realized I do not like doing this and, you know, switched gears. So if if you have the time, you know, to volunteer and especially to volunteer and say, I'd like to try out some different things. So right now we have a college student who is volunteering with us. She actually comes in three days a week and she's just dabbling. So, you know, we've put her in charge of uh, revamping a display case. So, you know, a hands-on um, project. We're going to have her do a little bit of database work. You know, if she can show that she has that experience um, it, with uh, archival, you know, um, database work, that's great on a resume. Maybe she's going to work in the library for a day and see what they do and how they catalog things. Um, you know, we'll, we'll put her out with the pit crew who work actually works on the cars, work with them for a day. Our road crew takes cars out. They, they have kind of have the funnest job in the museum, <laughs> yeah. but they drive cars out to events. We do Sunday drives once a month where, you know, people can come and get a free ride in a car. Really, it's just immerse yourself in all of these different experiences and figure out where did you get the most joy? Where did you feel the most productive? Maybe that's your career path. And you named a couple of things there that people I think wouldn't think of a museum. They think of a museum as static vehicles and you walk around and people tell you about them. But there's all this stuff right. in the background. You mentioned the pit stop pit crew guys that work on the cars. If you have a mechanic thought in your head or you love to work on old cars, you can go and do that. My son, when he was in high school, had to pick an internship to do. And I said, you know, you like cars. You know, I like cars. How about LeMay? And ended up working yeah. there for a summer. And uh, had he not been too busy going back to school, they even wanted him to stay and work longer. So, um, you know, he had the add pressure of me as the dad. You better do a good <laughs> right? job. Right? Yeah. Right? Yeah. We have had several interns and volunteers, younger folks who have gone on to careers uh, somewhere in the automotive world, maybe just in a museum, um, you know, of another kind. I love that. I love being a stepping stone towards that because I really feel that the younger generation is the key. One, to this hobby staying alive, but two, just to continue on, you know, the missions that we all have as museums and nonprofits in general. 
you know, you never know this where this might take you. I had a good friend in college, and I studied a lot of art history, and he loved art history and jewelry and became an expert in Fabergé eggs. And by, by volunteering at museums, he ended up in Russia at the the big museum there with the, the Fabergé exhibits. And now he goes and does lectures worldwide. I think he's in London this week giving lectures about, I mean, you never know where exactly. this can take you. And that's right. It's, it's quite astounding. He ended up writing a book with somebody, co-authoring a book. So very, very cool. Well, of course, challenges are a big part of running museums for a variety of reasons. I'd love for you to talk a little bit about what are some of the biggest challenges that museums face? I think probably money of is course, always yeah. It's always the first one, biggie. isn't it? Yes. Yeah. And I think museums, like maybe all nonprofits, we miss the boat a little bit sometimes by having too many events. You know, we're, we're trying to raise funds and it's a lot of work, you know, to generate your operating revenue from events. They're uh, very time consuming. They are, um, they're just tough. And I have learned probably a lot through my break when I, when I focused on development, it's so much easier to ask people for money than to try to raise it through events. And events can serve other purposes. You know, maybe you bring new people to hear about the museum or the uh, nonprofit, um, you know, so, so there's some mission in there, but really people want to give, they want to give where their passions are. So I consider myself kind of a Cupid in that way. You know, somebody has this passion and, you know, where can they invest that, whether that's volunteering or money, nonprofits, museums specifically need both of those. So finding those folks and, and making a match, you know, where, where can you best fit here? Um, so yes, money is a big challenge. Volunteers is often a big challenge. We have what I consider to be a world-class docent program that was developed by Bill Millard at the time. He uh, recently passed, but it's a fantastic program. It's really like a college course in automotive history and learning about um, all of that. So I feel like our volunteers who sign up for that course and, and sign up for a do the docenting program just get so much more out of it maybe than they ever expected in terms of just knowledge, making new friends, um, you know, getting to be around all these fabulous cars, learning the stories. One thing that, you know, museums really do and should do well is storytelling. So I just see that joy here. It's really probably the best thing about the museum and a place to work is that there's so much joy here. People are here because they love it and they love the cars and they love the people coming in and learning about the cars. So, um, you know, what, what starts as uh, a challenge and a problem, you know, if, yeah, if you can make those matches with volunteers and donors um, can really be your path to success. You know, it's a wonderful way for people that have the, the means to provide help. Uh, tax benefits, of course, are attached to that. And docents, a uh, person who's been a guest on the show, Wayne Craig, who's now a good friend of mine, is a, a docent who now is a docent. You may know Wayne. I'm not sure. He's down in Lodi, California. Um, cool. He works at a big hospital there, but he loves cars. So he became a docent. He's a docent on the lawn at Pebble Beach and other many events. And it's gotten him into these events in a very unique way. And he's, he's a very tall guy and he's very well-spoken, great fun. I'm going to be seeing him at the La Jolla Concord coming up here in April. And nice. that's another really great way. And then you make all these contacts with people right. and you get invited to go to other places. And in some mm -hmm. ways they have a little bit of funds to get you there perhaps or help you with the finances. But mostly you get to be an insider now. Yep. In these events and uh, it's it's great fun. So I'm glad you mentioned docents as it's well. So true. Let's talk a little bit about a bucket list for the museum. There, you know, we're pretty early in the year here, February. What's on your bucket list for what you want to accomplish this year at the museum? Well, some some pretty immediate things that we're doing. We did create some donor levels um, beyond memberships. What can we offer? And we have a lot to offer to donors who may want to contribute, you know, at the higher levels above our memberships. We are launching a legacy campaign. So um, looking towards plan giving and who may be, um, you know, kind of thinking about that at this time in their life. And that can even be early in your life, you know, thinking about it, planning for that. Um, but we're also 
also looking at some physical improvements to the building, to the facade of the building, um, just making us look maybe a little we- a little less warehousey and more museum-y and uh, making some improvements on the inside as well. We're looking to install some heaters this year that'll help with the chill during the winter months. We missed this winter, but we're, we're going to hit it before next winter. Um, yeah, so we, we've kind of got a, a grand scheme brewing um, that I think will make some major improvements to the museum this year. What about exhibits? What can people expect to see this year? Are you planning any special exhibits? We are. We have a great one right now. Ruka Se Caruchas, which is ladies in low riding. The uh, I was going to say, now, what did you just say? (laughs) Right. The literal translation, Ruka Se Caruchas, is um, old women in wheelbarrows, but it's slang (laughs) for ladies in low riding. Okay. (laughs) So uh, all of the cars that we have on exhibit right now are owned and maintained by women uh, who are, uh, you know, in the car world now. Sometimes because of their dads or husbands, but sometimes it's just, you know, uh, something that they have created within themselves to be a part of community. So it is this exhibit has been fantastic. It's been really well received and a lot of fun. Our next will be uh, VWs and other air cooled um, vehicles. So that uh, exhibit Cooler than cool. Cooler it's in than the cool. works. I like it. <laughs> that makes <laughs> sense for California works. too. Having I was a California <laughs> kid growing up in Southern California, and my uh, first fun car was a Carmen Ghia. Um, so uh, yeah, but I love the old VWs. My sister had a bug. The buses. Yeah. I just spoke to a guy this morning. Who I'm going to be having on the show. They take old VW buses and they electrify them. Much like uh, David Bernardo down in San Diego at Z Electric yeah. does the same thing. So pretty cool. Yes. In fact, there's a school here where the kids are um, creating an electric lowrider. So doing the conversion process themselves, building up from the building it from the ground up. So that'll be a lot of fun. And when they're done with that, it'll be in the museum. It'll go out on tour a lot because it will be a pretty special vehicle. But yeah, anytime we can tap into, um, you know, kids and projects that they're doing, as well as just something as interesting as that. That, you know, really has value. So right. very cool. Yeah. Sounds like a lot of fun reasons to go to Sacramento this year. For sure. And I have to go back. I have to go back to your Carmen Gia comment. I believe my aunt and uncle owned a Carmen Gia when I was a teenager and I fell in love hard with that car. Yeah. Every time we were around them, it was, do you need to run an errand? Can I go? <laughs> Can I? I was too young to drive, but uh, I always wanted to go with them. And I just really believe that that sparked a flame that is continuing on to today. My my favorite cars are still, you know, the European sports cars that just zip around. And I think that's where it started. You know, the Carmagia is interesting because it's one of those, because it was so mass produced, has never been thought of too much as collectible until probably the last 10 years, maybe so, or 15. Mm-hmm. And now all of a sudden, it's funny how cars over time, you start to look at them differently and they become classics, vintage if you will. Right. I like to think people look at me that way a little bit, but (laughs) at any rate, I've always, you know, going back to your youth and that history. And that brings me to the next question is a special vehicle in your life that you'd like to share a story about. Well, so yeah, I guess I beat you to the punch. That Carmen Ghia was definitely, you know, my very first car love. Um, But it has continued on, Um, you know, the the European, Italian, German, probably my dream car would be a Porsche 356 um, bathtub version. Love to just be zipping around in something like that. I did own a Fiat for a short period of time during my first stint here, but it was in the shop a lot. You know, the fix it. Fix again, it again, Tony. Tony. <laughs> yeah, that car lived up to the slogan. And uh, I, I, I realized, I think if I own a classic car, I need to also, you know, partner with somebody who knows how to work on them. Yeah. <laughs> it was in the, it was in the shop more than the garage. And most of the time, you know, I'd have to have it towed in because it wouldn't start or whatever. You know, the, the repairman there would just be like, okay. Look under the hood. You see that right there? Just get a big wrench, tap three times. <laughs> yeah. Sure enough, you know, these are things I don't know. So I need a knowledgeable person to be able to help me with that. Yeah. So maybe again someday I'll own a classic car. But uh, 
the nice thing is I get to be around them all the time oh, yeah. here. Oh. We had a, um, some of the, some of the car owners who have loaned their cars to us, um, want their cars exercised. So I get to take some of them out. Sometimes we had a Tesla Roadster in here my first term that needed to be exercised once a month. So, you know, I get to take it out on a Saturday and cruise around in it. So I get I get vicarious experiences as well as a few real experiences with the cars here. Well, you know what they say, the best kind of boat to have is a friend with a boat. So That's right. You figured it out. The best kind of classic car to have is a friend or a <laughs> museum full of classic cars. Right. And now you get to experience all these different things. When I did that TV show I did at your facility, we borrowed a 356 Porsche and I got to drive that to the museum and pull in the parking lot. And I've always wanted a 356. I think I missed that boat. Those things have become unobtainium in price. Oh my gosh. It's yes. just ridiculous, but uh, they're yeah. fun to think about. So maybe Carmen Ghia, maybe we should go back. <laughs> The thing about the Ghia, right. though, is I had a good friend who who found one. Mine was a 67, which is kind of a classic year for Volkswagen. And he said, Mark, I know you had one of these. You want to come over? I just bought this car. And, and I drove it, and it was a little bit, it was kind of like, I wouldn't say depressing, but it was like, this thing's really slow. Was my car this slow? <laughs> because cars are so <laughs> fast and they work so well nowadays. But it's true. it did stir some good memories. So uh, maybe I'll go find myself a Carmen Ghia and then. Put a 2.2 liter 911 inch in the back. Make that could work. Make it, or electric. <laughs> It'll be faster than anything. Right. 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 Yeah. yeah. yeah Those call. electric cars nowadays, they're competing with, you know, Everybody. all the sports cars out there. Yeah. The old zero to 60 doesn't mean anything anymore because a, no. a Tesla or, or or a Prius even can, can beat these cars. So. <laughs> Yeah, we have to change the um, the concept here. So I like to play car psychologist and get in yeah. your head a little bit here. Now, you're a creative person, so this could be interesting. If you were reincarnated, pun intended, as a vehicle, what would you be? But more importantly, why? Oh, so I, I feel like I'm repeating myself, but the answer has to definitely be a Porsche 356. Oh. I mean, they are cute in this, in this little, you know, I'm five one in thick socks. So little <laughs> is what I relate to without being pretentious, without being the Bugattis or the Rolls Royce or the Bentleys, just a fun little beautiful sports car. And I would choose red. I have a red VW now. So that's the closest I have right now. But uh, if I could come back as a car, it would definitely be that. Well, there's an advantage, Karen, and I'm not tall either, that we can fit in any little European sports car. Right? And you're a lady after my own heart. I love European sports cars from the 50s and 60s. Those are probably my yeah. favorite era from, from all different marks. I mean, you see today I'm wearing my Alfa yes. Romeo you know, sweatshirt. But love yeah, it. yeah, they're great fun. But yeah, the 356 is really cool. And if you go back and listen to my talk with, with um, Rod Emery or John Wilhoyt, who both restore 356s, but they make hot rod versions of those cars. So they put modified engines. You can make them look like an old classic, but they've got a, more power, more control. And Rod Emery's um, Outlaw 356s, once you drive one of those, you won't drive a regular 356 Ooh, again. That yeah. sounds good. Yeah, so uh, you've got some friends there that can hook you up for sure. <laughs> All right. You know, I always talk about giving back, but we've already discussed this at length. I don't even think we need to touch too much on it, and that is the museum gives back to people in so many ways. The idea of being docents, volunteers, people coming and learning bringing young people into the museum to learn about these vehicles that they've never even seen and maybe will never see again. Um, your programs to give back and encourage people to learn more about the history of automobiles is really the wonderful way you guys give back, right? Absolutely. And not only, like you said, a static display of cars, but, you know, we have classes. We have a youth engine class that sells out every time and has actually got a waiting list of dozens of youth that want to take this class. So we're looking for more instructors. We have a Model T driving class that's obviously for 16 and above. You got to have a license. You got to know how to drive a stick shift. But we've got a waiting list of over 75. Oh, my gosh. For that class. So People are really wanting to learn. We just need to accommodate that. We need to figure out how do we get these classes out to people? How do we get this education, especially to the younger generation? Yeah, it's so important. Uh, it will instill that passion that you and I had as little kids, you with that Gia and me with uh, my, remember I had an aunt when I was quite young who had a T-Bird, bright yellow 57 T-Bird, the porthole T-Bird. And uh, Love it. that kind of started it for me along with my dad's... Uh, 49 MGTC. 
There you go. Five years old. How about a great book? Is there a great book you could recommend for our listeners? Oh, goodness. I am a voracious reader, so it's hard to choose from all of them. I would have to say I read very little automotive stuff because I'm around it all day. It could be any kind of book. Yeah, but uh, let's see some recent ones that I really loved. Cast by Isabel Wilkinson. I'm going to go with Lori Frankel, Braiding Sweetgrass, Robin Kimmel, Robin Wall Kimmerer, some really good ones. So it's hard to choose. I love actually my genre of choice tends to be Stephen King, Nelson DeMille, pretty heavy, uh, yep, yep. <laughs> but I love, I love the lighter ones. Um, just finished Remarkably Bright Creatures a few months ago, and that was delightful. So kind of into all the genres. Well, that's very cool. And I always like to remind people of this because when I tell many people about this, they have no idea. Your local library will provide you with free audiobooks sent right to your device. All you have to do is get a library card, uh, sign up for an app like Libby. And my wife, Libby, my wife gets, uh, she's a voracious reader. She always has been, but she loves audiobooks now because yep. she can do other things while she's listening. Right. I think she listens to three, four books a week. Yeah. And they're all free. Nothing against Audible or anything, but, and you can request books too. So for you listeners out there that might say, well, I don't want the app or pay for it. You don't have to. Your local library, your taxes already exist for this. That's right. Yeah. It's just a wonderful thing. And if you go to new cities, you can many times go in as a visitor, get a temporary card and get books from them. We're, we're going to be heading off to Phoenix here. They have one of the best libraries for audiobooks in the country. Oh, nice. Yeah, quite amazing. So there, yeah. there's a little. I use one. Libby all the time. Love it. That's my favorite app. It's great. So before we part ways today, I'm going to enable you to go on the ultimate drive. Now we may already know the answer to this, but I'm oh, gonna, right? <laughs> since you, you get to be around and drive a lot of different cool cars, I'm going to park any cool car in your garage. You can take it on a drive anywhere in the world, but here's the key part because you're a people person. You could take anybody with you, including somebody from the past that's no longer with us. Yeah, it opens up the world to have opportunities for passengers. So what does the ultimate drive look like for you? Well, yeah, let's see. Not to repeat myself with the Porsche 356. Maybe let's go with the Carmen Ghia. Uh, and I'll take one that's a little souped up. That would be great. I'd have to dr go on a drive along the coast somewhere, whether that's, you know, the California coast or maybe the Amalfi coast. That's where it's going to be. Gosh, choosing somebody is tough. You know, do I go with my wife, one of my grandkids? Do I go with Tracy Chapman, Stephen King? Um <laughs> <laughs> all good choices. Right, right. But I mean, if I'm really truthful, not not to sound weird, I, I would probably have to go with Jesus. He's my crush. I love everything about him, but I have a lot of questions for him. I'll bet. <laughs> um, also, presumably, we'd be very safe, especially with him driving, right? Um, yeah, I probably wouldn't have to worry about anything happening. Yeah, a lot of questions. You know, what's going on with the world today? <laughs> A lot of what's, tests. What's, what's with all the gay stuff and Christians not getting with the program? I I don't understand it all. Bible misinterpretation. So we'd have a lot to talk about. You know, I'm figuring he's probably a pretty fun guy too. I would guess so. Well, this is kind of a cool <laughs> deal because given he could walk on water, you could drive on water. Exactly. So as you're driving on the coast, you could just pull out over the Lake Lugano and go for a drive. <laughs> so much fun. You I'm could serious. have a great fun. That's a great answer. I've had a couple of guests <laughs> who said they'd like to like to take God along with them on this drive. So oh, there you right. go. Pretty, pretty close. I know, he seems a little stuffier, but maybe. Maybe. <laughs> maybe so. Who knows? <laughs> that sounds like a fun ride to me. I thought I'd get a clever answer from you for that one. <laughs> You've taken us on a fun ride today, Karen. I'm so happy we were able to connect. Could you leave us with some parting words of inspiration or wisdom? Oh boy. Okay. Pressure's on. <laughs> right, right. Well, this I got from my dog. It's essential to chase what excites you, even if you never catch it. <laughs> so chase what excites you. Chase your passion. Pursue change. Don't be change averse. You know, we can hunker down. We can wrap ourselves in what we already know, wait for things to go back to the way they used to be, or we can step out into the unknown. <laughs> Flags flying, you know, wanting to grow, adapt, flourish. That's the way I want to live my life. And that's the advice I would probably give. You know, I love that advice. Uh, it's very pertinent to today's show, by the way. I have a, a friend that when I started this venture 10 years ago, being a podcaster, he was one person that advised me. I was really questioning. This was so out of my realm. 
that <laughs> he said, you need to do this. He said, to step out onto the, the edge of change is courage. And this show that we're doing today is the first show in the 10 years I've done this that I've throttled back to make change in my life and doing one show a week instead of the five that I've been doing all right. this time. So you are the fir my first here, which is really fun to have that happen because I want to make some changes and do some other things in my life. So That's wonderful. That was very pertinent. Kudos. This wasn't planned, but you were a perfect answer to that question. So Great. Glad I could toss you that softball. <laughs> yeah. Thank you for you listeners that are going, hey, Mark, wait, it's Thursday. You always have shows Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and in the past Fridays. For those of you who missed it on my blog, uh, that's what's going on. So that's why you didn't hear from me earlier this week. But we're still here. And Karen's the first one in this new change in my life. So thank you for being a part of that for me. Thank you. But you're welcome. How can people learn more about the California Automobile Museum and follow along? Sure. Check out our website, calautomuseum.org. Lots of fun stuff going on. We've got, you know, trivia nights and paint and sips along with, you know, our educational classes, tours. We have what we call touch tours for visually impaired. You're just going to find so many resources um, going on to our website as well as following us on social media. And that's at Cal Auto Museum. So uh, yeah, check us out. The new exhibit. I mean, you've got to see it. It runs through April. Rucas y Caruchas. So uh, come on down. We've got trips planned. We take day trips to San Francisco and the Bay Area. We have a trip coming up to the Carolinas. We're going to go to the Southern 500. We have a trip to Cuba in November that we're working on. So just a lot happening. Well, I'll make sure I put links on to all of these on Karen's show notes page in the Cars yeah website where you can find them, but they're very easy to find. You can just go on any search engine and find them. I encourage you to visit if you're in that part of California or make a special side trip, a road trip, perhaps spring's coming. It'll be here. I promise. I know it's still a little cold and wet, but, uh, and you guys down there in California have been getting a little more water, but you always we need sure it. Have. Yeah, yeah. I always, when I have my friends down there complain, I said, Hey, you guys are going to need this water. You always do. So, uh, just bear with it. We get a lot of water up in the <laughs> Pacific Northwest. So rain is yes. normal for us. And I'll also remind you listeners, I'll put a link on Karen Shono's page to the TV show, Cardia TV show on YouTube that I did. So you can see a little inside visual of the museum before you go. Thank you, Karen, for spending so much time with me today for uh, sharing your expertise and definitely your passion and for everything you do. Until you and I talk again, I'll see you at the California Automobile Museum. Thanks, Mark. You're welcome. 20, 50, or a hundred years from now, will there be a workforce to care for the collector vehicles we love? With auto shop programs disappearing across the country, it's a question we enthusiasts have to ask. That's why I support the RPM Foundation, which exists to ensure that the critical skills necessary to preserve and restore these vehicles aren't lost to time. One of the many ways RPM, which is short for Restoration, Preservation, and mentorship is accomplishing this goal is through workforce development initiatives. The RPM apprenticeship program enables the next generation of artisans to earn a living while they learn the craft of restoring and preserving these vehicles directly from industry professionals. The Endangered Skills Program documents the process of masters training future craftspeople on a variety of critical skills in danger of being lost forever. For more information on how the RPM Foundation is driving the future of the collector vehicle skills trade, visit RPM Foundation today. They're one of the charities of choice here on Cars Yeah. Thank you so much for joining us on today's ride here at Cars Yeah. Drive on over to CarsYeah.com to find show notes and inspiring automotive fun. Download your free copy of Filler Up a fun book filled with gorgeous photographs of fuel filler fun, including quotes from more inspiring automotive enthusiasts. Download your copy today, and we'll see you next time on Cars Yeah!